thanks everyone for coming on a Monday. Hope everyone had a good weekend. So this is going to be an experiment for us. It's a live, a live recorded session of the Analytics Everywhere podcast. So excited to have Zach Wilson here, who's a tech lead at Airbnb, and Max Bushman, who used to work at Airbnb and now is a founder and CEO of Preset. So as a way of introductions, I'd like for both of you to start by kind of talking about your careers in data. So data engineering is, is super hot nowadays, wasn't always that sexy. So I'm curious how both of you got your start and what excited you about jumping into this field. So I'll start with you, Zach, if you want to go first. Yeah, for sure. I think for me, the, I, in, in 2014, I read a stat and the stat that I read in 2014 was 90% of the world's data has been generated in the last 18 months. And I, when I read that stat, I was like, that's going to be a problem. That's going to be an issue. That's going to be something that we're, we're going to need to figure out and tackle. And I wanted to be a part of like managing that big problem. And uh, then I got a job at like Teradata where I was doing like MapReduce and Java and all the, you know, the really old Hadoop stuff. And yeah, that's like kind of how I got my break into it. And then then I got into Facebook a couple of years later where I really learned like data modeling and analytics patterns and like how to like, not just like write a pipeline, but write a pipeline that's actually like valuable and worthwhile and that is maintainable and stuff like that. And so, yeah, it's kind of like how I broke into data, I think. I'm like, uh, uh, first, I want to question your, your premise too. It's like you're, yeah. you're, you're, uh, you're, uh, that Srini said that, that data engineering is sexy now, or I don't know if yeah. that's really the case. There's a question. Yeah. There. I don't, at some point, like the se sexiest job in America was data scientist by some account, or there was like some publications on this stuff. I'm not mm. sure if, uh, d data engineering is getting there or if it will ever happen to, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Well, we could talk about that, but yeah, my, my story for me, I've been, I got in data like 20 years ago before the term data engineer existed. So I was a data warehouse architect, business intelligence engineer, kind of doing everything data when data was like a, a craft that only a few people did in the company and try to get other people to self-serve with tools like MicroStrategy and then business objects. So that was like my first decade. And then, um, then I joined Yahoo where it was like the birth of, um, uh, of Hadoop and a kind of this generation of stuff. I started probably 2007 or so then joined Facebook after that was like definitely like deep in that big data stuff. And then there was like a really cool Cambrian explosion of like data tools and people kind of reinventing everything because like nothing worked. All the toolings that, it, that existed before didn't work at Facebook scale. So they had to kind of reinvent everything, kind of add a culture of scratching their own itch. I think you, you are Facebook too. It was actually, you've, you've seen yep. that too. And then uh, I think like a lot of the ideas from there turn into, you know, proper products and companies down the line or open source projects and things like that. So I got into open source for me in the at Airbnb in 2014-ish is when I got into more open source and then started a company uh, about three years ago. And I still, something that's interesting too is like, we, sh we should talk a little bit about our vantage point into the engineering because like you're, I think we're going to be talking about data engineering and some of the trends and things. And I think a lot of that depends like where you're sitting, kind of like your view on like what's happening, you know, depends like where you're at, what you're doing. Uh, so I used to be at big companies and all this stuff. Now I'm much more um, uh, a practitioner. So I still do a lot of the data engineering internally. I'm very close to the data team here at Preset. I've seen the perspective from a, a startup perspective too, of like being more scrappy, using a bunch of SaaS tools, kind of like very practical approach as opposed to like, hey, we have a data infrastructure um, team of like, you know, 50 people or something like that. Like Airbnb's got a, like a gigantic data team. Um, mm -hmm. so it'd be interesting to kind of uh, compare these vantage point, the perspective and then, you know, different perspectives here. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Um... Yeah, so that, that's a good segue, actually. So I'm curious, Zach, I know both of you spend a lot of time in larger organizations. Um, what, like, from your perspective, like, how has data engineering changed, like, the way it's done in larger organizations? Like, what are the kind of experiences that you've had that you feel like are, you know, somewhat unique to the problems that large, large companies have? Yeah. Um, I think there's a couple things there. Like, I think one of the things that large companies is that like, there's just so much data everywhere that like knowing what pipelines to build is, is something that is tricky. And I think like earlier when I first like was working at Facebook, it was like, just like write 
as many pipelines as you can, like, right? Because it's more important to have a pipeline built than it is to like just have raw data. And I think I kind of noticed a shift over the last couple of years where now people are like, we don't want the proliferation of all these just like kind of one-off pipelines that are just solving a specific problem. And like, they want more like robust data models. They want things where it's like, oh, these keys can join with these keys and it works, right? It's like, feels like it kind of has got, come full circle back to like relational database land, but like, but like in like a data modeling, like data engineering, like horizontally scalable way. Um, yeah, definitely. I think that that's kind of one of the things I've noticed at big companies over the last little while. Yeah, yeah. What, what, one thought about around this is like that. There's this like maturity life cycle, you know, of like each company is in a different place in their data journey, and you know, like Airbnb is a kind of deep, deeper, I guess, in their maturity cycle. So maybe they're at a place that like, oh, we don't want crap pipelines. We if we're gonna do something, we're gonna do it right. Like it, and it hurts more in this, in this like part of the maturity cycle to like do something quick than doing something right, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. But one thing that's interesting too is that like different teams in large organization now that everyone is doing data and everyone like the uh, call it like the democratization of the analytics process where right? like every team is maybe in a different place in their maturity life cycle too you know but clearly I think I would say Airbnb I would probably characterize as like being like very far in their data journey probably or I, I mean know. I don't like when I first got at Airbnb like and I was like expecting like netflix or facebook level maturity and like it was a little jarring because they were they are actually a little bit like in terms of data infrastructure they're a little bit behind from them right and i was like whoa that's and i was like wow i, I have to like actually ssh to like you know deploy a pipeline i actually have to like use linux to do this again it's not just like magic command line thing do the thing right and then it just magically does everything that you expect it to do i mean it's definitely in even in the time i've been there it, like it's it's evolved quite a bit and i'm so much more efficient than i was when i first started because like we we have invested a lot in like this thing called like the de pave path which is like a tools for data engineers to build pipelines to make it as quick and easy as we can build to make pipelines and that's been it's been great to like watch that evolve and i'm like wow these tools actually work this is great Hey. Well, so, so I don't know. I know, I know nothing about that. I don't know if you, you, we should do a deep dive into this. It might be interesting to talk about this. But I think like one thing I'm picking up on to on to is um, like going from a company to the other. As a data engineer, you see the first companies are not in the same place in maturity life cycle, but they also like might be. There's a bunch of sub cycles of maturity. Like they might be really mature on one front, really immature on the other front. It might be mm -hmm. really good around like, I don't know, data quality and then weak on metadata management or things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's it'd be kind of interesting to, to dig into the companies we've been at and what their strengths and weaknesses might have been. It might be like yeah. too much information. I don't know if it's yeah. okay. <laughs> you know, I'd be like, uh, this company is really bad at X, you know? Yes. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's this impression like going from Facebook to Netflix in your case and Netflix to Airbnb and the, you know, the big differences there that mm -hmm. you can talk about, I think is an interesting topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think a bit, another big one that I noticed, especially that was that where Netflix and Airbnb are similar, that is different from Facebook is that like Netflix and Airbnb are like, they treat data engineering, like software engineering, where they're like, Oh, you're on a pipeline. Where's the unit tests? Where's the integration tests? Like, um, okay. Uh, Where's the spec? Did you get a design spec? Did you get a design review on this? Like, it's like, it's a very, like, uh, the process is a lot. And they're also like, yeah, don't use SQL, use Scala, right? You, you need to use Scala, right? Scala Spark, right? And that's going to be how you write your pipelines, high quality pipelines. Whereas at Facebook, it was more like, okay, use SQL to move data around and build a pipeline that way, right? And that like, um, it was just a, just a very different like mindset on like how they approached building a pipeline in, in like where one was like, we want to it, it, it goes really back to their cultures in some ways where it's like facebook's like we want to move fast we want to deliver value and move fast and and that's where they're like yeah sql is the way to do that because that's the fastest way you can write a pipeline but then uh, netflix and airbnb are like mm, we want more quality here we want like we want it to we want to treat this like an engineering problem like a very like software engineering problem and yeah that was definitely something i noticed that was like pretty different i actually like the other mindset of like treating it like a software engineering problem because i think it's that's what it should be it, it, like data engineering and software engineering overlap enough in that area that like that's not something i think that like you should like 
sacrifice like software engineering fundamentals for data engineering speed. Like, I mean, it's unless you're at a, like a very small company. I feel like if you're at like a small company where you can iterate fast and that like the, um, the trade-off of like not doing it right, like isn't blown up by scale, then like iterate as quick as you want. But like, if you're in a big company, like treat it like a software engineering problem. I think that that's the, the right approach. For sure. or, or if you're in a big company and you're working on a new product that you know is just getting its first uh, you know wave of data getting logged to, maybe it's okay too to be like, mm -hmm. hey, maybe I'll need the rigor of the big company and a super mature organization for you know a product that we might throw away, right? Or a new a new feature, yeah. for, for mm -hmm. things like that. So it's like be scrappy in the right places and be um, be rigorous, you know, where it matters in general you know um but yeah, it's interesting because like the airbnb you're talking about is not the same one i left to or yeah. that I, left, I was there 14 to 17 and i would say at the time it was kind of the the rise of the data engineer there we had a lot of data quality problem and we're right you know the, the core data engineering team was writing a lot of hive ql you know coordinated by airflow so there was like a shit done of you know hql and uh, I can see how, you know, after many years of that and everything that's unmanageable from, from that, that they went to like, okay, let's use Scala where we can. Let's use, uh, you know, more mature, more rigorous things in the places that matter. Mm. Yeah, so that's a good segue actually then to kind of Max, how you, what's your experience been uh, helping kind of manage uh, data and analytics for a startup? Um, like what's kind of the, What's kind of the, the preference for the hardcore software engineering tested approach uh, versus a little bit more of the, the SQL uh, get things done quickly approach, at least. Yeah, whatever it works, you know, exactly. at the climbing the, the early beginning of the maturity life cycle. Well, so the first thing I was really impressed to find that there, there is like big company level infrastructure available off the shelf and it's like pay as you go. You can sign up for you know, BigQuery or Snowflake today and get a really awesome service that's going to scale to infinity. Um, it's pretty easy to get, you know, um, Airflow Astronomer or to get, you know, DBT Cloud um, set up and just kind of get going very quickly. Uh, stuff like Fivetran makes it really easy to do data sync, right, or data integration at the low level. So you just like these, these services are very affordable, very easy, very rewarding to use, like stuff like high touch for reverse ETL. It's like, you set it up and, you know, I think I had set, I set up in half an hour, you know, things like that. So it's really yeah. rewarding, you know, to, to see that. And then in terms of like the rigor stuff, it's like, I think at the beginning, you don't have much to stand on. So, um, so you're just gonna do what you can with what you can. But I think like we got to a really good place pretty quickly as a startup because infrastructure was not a concern. It was a little bit like, what, you know, should we use, you know, Snowflake or BigQuery or what should we set up first? But like, once you, you've got this thing going, I think you can get to really insightful data visualization quickly. Uh, first, we had logging from the get go, you know, kind of from, from Superset too, like Superset had pretty good logging. So we do like product analytics, usage behavior and all that stuff uh, fairly quickly. But yeah, I've been surprised like how, how you can have like a world-class like data engineering, data infrastructure, um, you know, within months with like a very small team. Yeah, the, the, those, the rise of those like SaaS products, that's like one of the things, like one of the questions I get asked a lot from like, you know, aspiring data engineers and stuff is like, should I learn Scala to like uh, become a good data engineer? And I'm like, I mostly say no. I actually say no, because I'm like, well, if you look at BigQuery, you look at Snowflake, you look at how these things like, they're making them they're making it so easy they're making it so that like like these things like like that's kind of like obsolete it's kind of like the old generation it's, i kind of like look at scala right now is like it's kind of like the java map reduce of like you know like 10 years ago right where it's like yeah it was used and it was fancy and it was awesome but we we see the writing on the wall we see that that's not like that's not where it's going like the future is going to be more SaaS oriented easier to use like etl and it should be i mean i i honestly wonder about like if like the data engineering and pipeline work is actually gonna get to a point where like, it's actually owned more by like analysts and data scientists again, like where if it, it, like where it actually shifts back to being like, oh yeah, like we, we've, removed, we, we've removed a lot of the technical barriers. So now like go write your pipeline, go you know, have fun, right? 
Yeah, that part we see like so that's like the the analyst engineer role, you know. I I, I don't know how widely accepted it is, but on, on data Twitter, you know, it's a big thing. Yeah. I don't know if in the real world like how much of that is true in the day to day. It's, it's not Airbnb, yeah. Like analytics engineer, like spanners, yeah. like spanners analytics engineer. Yeah, for sure. Those are like yeah, that, that role is like we're we're definitely hiring for that role right now too. So yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a very real for sure <laughs> yeah so that's a really interesting thing too that means you know the like nowadays analysts write pipelines um and they're vertically aligned right so that means they, they work for a certain vertical so they might work on the fraud team at airbnb or like the you know the bookings team or, or whatever the teams are and then they write the bulk of the pipeline probably often in sql uh core like orchestrated by something like Airf airflow dbt and then that means like that is, is eroding away from the data engineering role, right? Like so core pipelines or, you know, maybe vertically aligned pipelines are not managed by data engineers. Uh, maybe core pipelines, like the pipelines that are cross team that serve the, the uh, organization as a whole, maybe those are still owned by, you know, the crafty uh, professional data engineers. And then there's stuff like stuff like infrastructure, um, stuff like data sync, right? Like scraping the the Zendesk API to sync the data and stuff like that, that, that you can do from the SaaS side. So the data engineering role is like getting, you know, kind of squished in between like the analyst engineer on one side and like infrastructure as a service. So, so there's a question now, it's like, what's core, what's left, you know? Um, so I don't know what, what you see there. Maybe it's like core pipelines is, or, you know, sync infrastructure. I, I, I think there's a couple angles there where like for data engineers to like carve out some things like I think on one side it's um, like core infrastructure and like uh, but also like I think like sorry, my one second. There you go the, the we knew that being live there's going to be like something like that but yeah it should be easy to the, the power of editing. Uh, wait, actually, no, they're, they're not dead. Never mind. They're, they're actually still up. It's, it's, it's like weird. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, I think that like data engineers, like uh, it, it comes comes back to like the data pro products, right? Like, because I also think like there's things like you know Streamlit that's coming out, like building out like like REST APIs and ser the serving layer. That's not just like hey, here's your data, and then like that's the end of the data engineer contract. It's like oh, we're gonna build a pipeline, and then like the um the way that it's served is like oh maybe it's a rust api maybe we're gonna build a light front end right and it becomes more like full stack right and i think that that could be another area where like data engineering can grow and that, like where it's not just like boxed in by like the data side of things like uh, on on the you know on the integration side is easier because of SaaS, and then on the, the vertical side it's like okay that's more analytics focused now and so i think that there's going to be like that area where data engineers will probably need to grow technically as well to like kind of like that could be a way to kind of not feel like oh my career upside is limited right where it's like i'm just working on this very specific type of pipeline yeah. it mm -hmm. seems kind of like you know the, the whole point the original point of data engineering was to take uh traditionally trained software engineers and apply them to the problems of data and now that that role is changing there's still new things as zach just mentioned there's still new needs for software engineers um in data organizations is that is that kind of a fair uh, summary, Zach. Yeah, yeah, and like, um, and th that that was actually what my at, like at Netflix, my my job title was actually like in the middle there. It was software engineer data. That was like my job title where I was like working on data pipelines. I was still writing Spark and doing all that stuff, but I was also working on like infrastructure stuff. Like, a I was working on APIs for like the security team. Like, oh yeah, this the security team like reads my data and does some stuff, and then it writes back data. Like, it was like it was both read write APIs and stuff like that, which was very different from like a traditional data engineer role. And I think that like building out products like that and uh, kind of going back into like the software engineering side of things, I think, well, I kind of think of it as like, it's gonna split two ways. Like one is like, you have data engineers that are gonna split off in that direction and be more like software engineering and technical. And then you have the data engineers that are gonna split the other way that are gonna go deeper into like analytics. And they're gonna do like more of the like analyst AE role where they're going to take the other side of it, right? And they take the um, the downstream dashboarding vertical pipelines, and they, they they just own like the whole stack there. And I think that like that split could potentially happen, and we're seeing that with the new job titles that are coming out, right? So yeah, yeah for sure. Like, <laughs> yeah, we see like on one side the analyst engineer that's a real role, and like you know that's a real skill set, and it totally makes sense to kind of 
uh, to, to kind of box those skill sets together of like, you know, some like the, the pipeline writing plus like analytical mindsets, being able to really understand the business and write the pipeline and build the right, you know, dashboards and data products in the different verticals. You know, there's other things we didn't talk about too. Like once you like other things that are core to the engineer that are going to stay there, there's stuff like uh, performance and cost management, right? So mm -hmm. your, your snowflake bill go, grows like bigger every month. And at some point it grows exponentially and the value that you get out of it is not growing exponentially. Maybe it is, but uh, yeah. someone needs to like keep the check in, uh, keep the check in, in check. There's also um, making sure that the, the, the analyst engineers are actually respecting data engineering best practices too, right? So the analyst engineer, they might be less concerned around like, the, like naming convention, uh, you know, writing tests. So like we, we need to, to maybe herd the analyst engineers, you know, and then make sure that they, they become good at the things, the data engineering practices that matter. Um, there's things too, like metadata management. It's always been a big thing though. There's tooling there too. So that's probably getting eroded by tools like Amundsen and uh, data hub and others too. Like maybe that's becoming solved by software, but you still need to like, you, you still need to orchestrate all of that and make sure that, you know, overall as an organization, you're good at metadata management and the tools are not just going to, you know, do it all by, by itself. So there's, so there's still like, uh, uh, the, the point of retreat, you know, is still pretty massive. There's the scope of that point of retreat is big. And then the skill set is as valuable as ever, right? Like if you have the mm -hmm. skills of a really good data engineer, then, you know, you can change your title or whatever, but the skills are still super, super valuable. Yeah. Uh, makes sense. Actually, this is a perfect segue to the core theme that we have for this conversation, which is building data products. So, um, how, how would kind of, I'd love to get both of your definitions on what a data product is and even why we need this new word. Uh, like, you know, what was, what was, what was the problem with just kind of calling the data assets, um, internally as they were called before. Uh, so this time actually, I'm curious to get Max's perspective first, and then we'll talk to Zach. Yeah. So first I want to disambiguate. We at Airbnb, we used to call data products, what we now call data apps, right? So a data apps is a huge thing. So so I can try to define that just to, to, to disambiguate and kind of say we're not talking about this today, but data apps are, you know, apps that are very heavy on the analytic, analytics front. So there are apps that have, you know, interactive data visualization, there are apps that, you know, allow you to take action on the data and to interact and, you know, consume and, you know, look at the data. Um, so now I think we call those data apps, uh, and then data product, it, I think comes from the data mesh papers or, or maybe, um, area of research. And, and then this is the idea of treating data sets as products and to have like really clear governance rules and then really clear, maybe APIs and guarantees around change management, having clarity around like stuff like ownership stuff like yeah, governance rules, who, sh who should access it, what's private, what's public, mm -hmm. and, get, and providing guarantees around that kind of stuff. Um, I think that's what it is. And I think we're talking about the data product from like the data mesh-ish um, area today, right? Yeah. And, and I, I think uh, like uh, another key thing that I've noticed with like data products is the um, kind of the changing of like what writing to production means, right? Because like before writing production is just like, okay, the data's there, it shows up, right? But now writing to production is more treated as like a contract where it's like, okay, did you do your quality checks? Like, is it efficient? Like, and like, and all, like, do all the quality checks pass? And like, did you do your due diligence on like naming conventions and all that stuff? So then that's one of the things that Airbnb had this thing called the Midas process, which I think is really, nailing that data product thing where like every Midas pipeline that you create creates a data product that has like all the right governance, all the right quality checks. It like goes through all the pieces of the puzzles so that we're like, okay, yeah, this data set we can definitely make, you know, really big decisions on if we need to, because we know it's gonna, it, 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 it passes the bar to be like a product. It's like a seal of approval quality and like the set of guarant constraining guarantees that people seem to want to rely on something, right? Maybe that's something mm -hmm. we lacked in the past and data engineering, just like it's a big warehouse, people create data sets, it's all free for all. You don't know who anyone can use anyone else's data set, you know, and mm -hmm. 
uh, and then like different teams have different naming conventions, um, like that sort of things, which allows you to move fast, but then creates a gigantic like mess that I've been referring to in the past as the mountains of SQL, or you have this mountain of like shit ton of SQL that's kind of all over the place, gigantic DAGs that no one can make sense of, you know. Uh, so I think that's going, that we're trying to address like that issue of just like too much, just too much shit in the warehouse, you know? Oh yeah, that's what, that's my, one of, one of my main things I do at Airbnb is delete Hive queries. That's like, and, and every time I delete a Hive query, I'm just like, ah, feels so oh. good. <laughs> <laughs> Facebook had an internal group and uh, called Dead Code Society. I don't know if you remember that. Or if oh, I, yeah, I still, oh yeah, yeah. So you get a t-shirt, you deleted more than like 10,000 lines of code or something. You get a special mm. t-shirt called, a, it's like the Dead Poet, Poet Society, but Dead Code Society. You get rewarded oh, yeah. for deleting old shitty code. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was actually talking with my manager about that recently. I was like, I think over my time so far at Airbnb, I'm still like in the minus, like I have more minus like deletions than I have additions. Like, and I'm like, wow, that's crazy. I'm like, I'm just deleting code. Like I haven't even replaced the code that I deleted. It's like less code. So awesome. <laughs> you Sometimes probably like, deleted some, yeah. some of my code. Uh, oh yeah, I'm definitely. Surprised if you did. <laughs> sure, for sure. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, just the thought that there might still be code uh, outside of Airflow and Superset that I've written that, you know, pipeline type codes, DAG codes that would still be running and like, just get like a shiver on my spine. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, I'm curious, like, when, uh, when, when, do y'all, when do you guys feel like that organizations start needing to think this way? Like, is it they hit a certain point in the kind of move fast and break things method or kind of the, the lack of, of discipline? And then they they run into problems, and is that is that kind of when you guys feel like people organizations start to think about, hey, we need to be more careful here. Like, what are some of the triggers that you guys have seen in your experience that cause people to wake up to this to this mindset a little bit? You start, Zach. Okay, um, I think uh, there's a couple things there. Like, uh, one is around like, I like I, one thing I've noticed that happens is like people like when they're trying to apply machine learning, one of the things that happens is that they have like these models that get really complex and then they will notice they're like, hey, I have three sources for this one thing, right? And it's like, why? Like, which one's the right one? And then there becomes this kind of like, uh, like it, become, there's a, it becomes this awareness of like, okay, like why are there all these duplicates? Why do these numbers not match up? I think a lot of times this comes when like you're validating things with data scientists and then they're like, okay, do we match it against this table or this table or this table? And, and they, there's just like this awareness that like, okay, like if we want to do machine learning, right, we need to have like good feature stores and we, ha- we need to have good, like consolidated options for this stuff. And I think that's like a big area where like, they're like, whoa, this is like, we need to, we need to have like, we need to up the quality bar for our data so that we can have good, make good decisions, both like strategically and with like machine learning. I, I, I think that's where I've, no- that's where I noticed it at Facebook, at least when I was like working in notifications and we had like all these upstream things for like our machine learning models. And I was like, this stuff is way crazy. And some of this is not even trustable. Like it feels like we're building like this massive, massive, massive heavy product on top of like a a house of cards. Right. And then you realize like, oh yeah. Oh, now the machine, the machine learning thing broke because uh, the data quality was bad. And then we, you know, lost a million dollars or whatever. And then we got to go back through and figure out like, oh, we can't build these big heavy models on top of houses of cards. I think that's like, how I've seen like that kind of get adopted more like after, yeah, once you have enough machine learning errors, that's when people are like, okay, yeah, we, this is something we need to invest in. Yeah, it's it, it, If you think about it, it's like constraints and guarantees, right? So I think like at some point you need to have more guarantees. So you have to have more constraints to enforce and then the cost is moving, you know, it's slower, but to build things that are probably going to last longer too. So those trade-offs are pretty clear. They exist Similarly, in, in software engineering, it's kind of interesting to draw some of the parallels there. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, I think like if you publish, you know, you think about Airbnb being public now too, there's a requirement of like, if you're going to publish numbers, you better have like traceability and be able to explain where these numbers came from, right? If you're talking mm-hmm. just a number of bookings, like what is a booking and how is it computed? Um, it can't just be like, you know, uh, someone kind of making, making stuff up or having different numbers internally that don't align with the numbers you're publishing. On the, on the ML side too, like now we're getting products to, uh, like we're getting uh, people to look into like, 
why is newsfeed sorted this way at Facebook? You know, where's that bias coming from to, and like legally you need to be able to explain how I uh, think a model or not even legally, but it's just even like you have the duty to kind of make sure that the decision you made are informed by, you know, data that can be relied on too. So I think that's, that, that drives some of the rigor requirement, you know, um, one thing that's interesting maybe to, to highlight is like, do you, do you have as an organization to go through this like rite of passage of like suffering from bad data and bad data engineering to get, get above it? Or could you just start, you know, from the get go and get it right? And I think like it's easier nowadays, I think, to get it right. Or, you know, as we build our stuff at, at preset, um, so very much like building from scratch, right? We're like, okay, pick some piece of infrastructure set up five trend to load some data, use segment to get our log data in. Then mm -hmm. from this point on, we started doing transformation. Like, okay, we're gonna have to coordinate a bunch of SQL. Uh, picked up DBT because it's just a really easy way to run a bunch of SQL in the database. And like, we try generally to, you know, follow a naming convention and things like that. But at the same time, it's not the primary concern. The primary concern is like, what's in our data? Like how many active users do we have? You know, mm -hmm. uh, answer the very big questions and then, you know, and maybe maybe the normal path is to do that in a, a slightly scrappy way and retrofact it, kind of go back to the foundation, the house of card, and like put the pillars in the right places and refactor the, the you know the the pipelines that that matter most. But you know, front loading with good practices um, is definitely a good thing because if you want to if you have to rebuild everything uh from this from scratch a year in it just doesn't happen to like the data warehouse don't get you know rewritten <laughs> yeah yeah uh that makes sense uh, yeah it does seem like i think now if you're a new organization maybe you can learn from the mistakes that have been made in the past um yeah. and hopefully you know start from from first principles um, a little bit. Um, it's actually a good segue to, uh, since both of you have worked kind of in a mix of both startups and large companies, I'm curious, you know, a bunch of data tooling startups nowadays are founded by people who've worked at large companies and who have, you know, where they have a lot of great internal tooling that they've built. Uh, with that backdrop in mind, what internal tools at these organizations have not made their way to open source, uh, to startups? Like what, what's kind of still missing that you guys uh, miss working with uh, or have seen worked and uh, work well in large organizations that's still not um, those ideas haven't really made it out uh, to you know the, the rest of the world sounds like Midas is a good answer I don't know much yeah. well Midas is like a process it's more of like a process that data engineers need to go through like the the first thing that came to my mind was actually uh, at Facebook they have this tool called scuba and scuba is like a way to visualize like real time data that was like just like you could really test things out, especially whenever you set up a new experiment, you could then see it like immediately be like, oh, yeah, see, it's changing the metrics because like we have the real time like data. It's like listening on the queue. Right. And it's actually like reading in the data for you. And like I have. I've never seen like, like everywhere else that I've done real time stuff. It's always been such a pain to get something like that. And like with scuba, it was just like there. It was just like, it was, it felt like magical in some ways where I was like, oh, I changed the logging and I can like see it like manifest. It's like, whoa, this is crazy. And uh, that kind of tooling was you know, really, really powerful for sure. Like, like that's the, that's the main one I, I can think of like from the last couple of years that I've been working. Yeah, I, I can talk about scuba too. So, um, so it's like you can kind of, you can go and recreate scuba today, but I think the horizontal alignment of scuba of like how it, it all worked together is the part that made it so magical. But you, you mm -hmm. the scuba backend, so I think it used to be called Rockford Express or something like that. But it's like yeah. the scuba backend is similar to Druid in a lot of ways, except it's written in C plus um, plus. Mm -hmm. The front and superset is is very inspired from the the scuba front end too. So our explore mm -hmm. part and superset is like kind of form driven data exploration, data visualization with fancy things, you know, like window functions and like month over month compares and that kind of stuff. So this, I think the superset, superset is similar, parts of superset are similar to scuba front end. And then part of magic with scuba too was the scribe integration. So scribe is like Kafka. And then there's a login framework called logger right at Facebook. And there's all these pieces exist 
I think in open source land or in, in SaaS in the SaaS world, but they're not like they're at Facebook, you just add a new logger event and then automatically if you add a new scribe category a new they would create a new kafka topic for you and it would start flowing and you could just go that day the moment you launch the thing it would you know you'd be able to go and look at your data in real time and the that horizontal or is it vertical or horizontal integration here um however we call it i think it's vertical yeah. integration but like make like they have these different pieces of the stack like mm -hmm. just log the thing and then it all it's all integrated with the experimentation framework with a real-time stack with like stuff like puma that was like a a stream uh, processing framework, like all these things were just like tightly coupled and worked very well together. So in the modern data stack, we don't, we're very loosely coupled. And I think like that's some of the innovation we'll see in the modern data stack is like the vendors and uh, the pieces of technology integrating themselves together so we can recreate that experience of like, you know, our like vertical integration that works like seamlessly. We're not there yet. There's a lot of work to be done there. I'll share Airbnb on that. Like, like if you want to log something new, how fast can you look at it in real time and like Druid and Superset at Airbnb today? I got to go and set up some stuff. Yeah, it's 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 actually pretty good. It's actually pretty good. It still it doesn't feel quite as magical as like setting up a scribe category and then boom, but right. But it's like pretty close to that. Like, because uh, Airbnb they have this thing called Jitney, like a Jitney event, and then they have a it's similar to like Scribe in that way, where you can kind of like see that stuff. So yeah. Yeah, and it's cool. I like using Superset uh, um, at Airbnb. So, I, I, I'm never going to use Tableau ever again. Like Superset is better. <laughs> hey, so if you want to try Superset today, uh, come to preset.io to uh, <laughs> for a free trial. Uh, yeah. But yeah, thank you. Yeah, this is not a, a product placement, but I, I used it as such. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we did not pay Zach to say this. <laughs> um, <laughs> not yet, but now we might pay him because that was. <laughs> We might have to now. Um, so it seems like, you know, because of, of Scuba and how, how great uh, the tooling was integrated within Facebook, uh, it provided a great experience. I'm curious what else, like, you know, from a metadata management standpoint or lineage, like what are, what are other types of um, problems that have been solved in large organizations when they had that data product type of thinking um, that maybe are still like, are still nascent or, or kind of new for in, in open source or within startups? Because it does seem like in these organizations, there's a much more magical experience that there's still kind of a big gap that's been trying to be, that gap is trying to be closed by like patchwork of tools that maybe don't integrate that well together. I think some of those problems are like different though. Cause I, I think like, for example, line, like the lineage problem, right? I think like at a, at a small company, it's like, like it's not, it's like a non-issue for the most part. Cause it's like, you only have so many data sets. It's like, okay, you have lineage of 10, you have 10 data tables. It's like, okay, I can probably figure out where this came from if there's only 10 of them. But if you have right. tens of thousands of data sets, that's where lineage really shines. And uh, I think that, yeah, li lineage is like a super important thing for like when you want to like migrate and deprecate and get rid of things. Like when you have a lot of people depending on your data sets and like being able to track like, okay, these guys have not migrated yet. So we need to go talk with them. So that like, cause that's the other thing is like, you can use like code search to do it. Right. And that sometimes will work, but then it's like, oh, but like, what if they dynamically, you know, uh, read from your table from like a, like a query parameter or something like that, then it's like, oh, you can't find all of them. That's where like doing things with lineage and parsing the query logs and understanding like, oh yeah, this, you know, this data, this data set has this much usage. I think that's another thing that the big tech companies do well, that's kind of separate from lineage is that they are pretty good at managing like, okay, this data set should have this retention because it's been used this much. That's a the, at Facebook, they had a tool called Cockpit that like you could like look at a data set and be like, oh, we can change the retention from four years to three years because no one is even looking at that data from four years ago. So we don't need it at all. And like, they're very good at that kind of efficiency of being like minimizing the cost of their infrastructure by looking at like where, like where there's some low hanging fruit uh, in, in the data world. Cause there's always going to be data that is held that we aren't looking at and it can be a trade off, right? Cause some data scientists are like, well, we're going to need it later. Like we're going to regret deleting it. Don't, don't, you know, don't change the retention. Right. Uh, but like um, that's definitely, I think another kind of tool that like, uh, is going to be a part of this integrated, like new modern data stack is like, okay, how do we manage this stuff? And other things are like, 
uh, other big pieces of that as well are like the laws, right? Like how do we get our data in compliance with like GDPR and CCPA and whatever other new laws are gonna be on the horizon, right? And I think that that's gonna be another big part of this new modern data stack for sure. Yeah, on, on my side, I try to think of the things that are maybe less to have like big company problems. So, so there's a lot of like of the innovation and the bigger companies that come from uh, that come from scale and not just from scale of you know the data itself, but mostly from scale of the analytics process and having so many people involved into it. Like the moment that your your whole data warehouse doesn't fit in someone's head anymore at a high level, then you need to have better documentation, better you know lineage tools, better tools that are generally like more more rigor around metadata, whether it's like operational metadata, statistics, um, whether it's governance type metadata, so all that stuff you need you need as you, you need increasingly as you scale and it might be exponential how much uh, like maybe you grow linearly your data team but how much you need these things um probably grows grows faster with more people uh, one thing i think some of the things that we've built so a lot of the things i think that we've seen built are getting picked up they're not getting mainstreamed but uh things like you know, at Airbnb, we used to scrape the hell out of um, REST APIs to do like five trend type things before five trend existed. So now there's five trend, or we used to do the equivalent of reverse ETL with a, a way to take analytics from the warehouse and put it, I think, in H base where they could be accessed by people building the product. So they could look at, you know, real time or analytics type data while, you know, building a page on, on Airbnb and stuff like that. So I think we've, we're seeing these things getting built um some are missing from like as in a universal type of fashion or in an open source and then we, we're lacking some standards in some areas uh one that i can point to is like database statistics i talked about this on the podcast before i think when we talked with chris there's this huge opportunity to have um, a big statistics database built from your warehouse. So if we can have a lazy process, that would be collecting a bunch of stats, like column level stats, uh, table level stats, like how many rows in each partition and for each column, what's the histogram and what's the min max value percentage of null. Like if we were to build a service that can read from a bunch of data warehouse and collect statistics and those statistics can be used for so many things. And one one of the it can be used for data quality, kind of do time series on stats, uh, anomaly detection. It can be used for, you know, uh, all sorts of other things. Even like in, within tooling, right? And things like superset, we could see like, oh, you're you're playing with this data set. Here's you know a bunch of profiling and statistical data about the columns and data sets you're using, whether you're writing a pipeline or doing some analysis. So. I would love to see that information service. We built some, I don't, you tell me if it still runs at Airbnb, but we built something yeah. called Stats De Demon. Um, I think it was like kind of a fun project with Aaron Keys. I think, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't think he's still there. I'm not sure if he's still at Airbnb uh, or not, but. Yeah, I, I have not used that. No, I, 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 so I, it was a good idea and no one, could, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it would monitor um the the data lake essentially and look at part new partitions coming in the meta store and then build a bunch of statistics and put it in a in a postgres or a mysql database so that mm. can be used for all sorts of other things you know it's, i think it's just such a good idea to have like a stat service uh especially in the context like you know databases like oracle used to maintain their statistics and turn internally for the date for the query optimizer to use so you'd have to like compute your stats in Oracle so that the query optimizer would optimize your query. Now, like all that stuff is like each parquet segment has its own statistics that are getting used by the execution engine, so execution engine optimization. But mm -hmm. then where are those stats now? They're like in parquet files footer and they would be so much more useful if they were, you know, available to the ecosystem in general, right? If we were able to look at all these stats, uh, it'd be, be so useful. Definitely. And like, I think another thing that's kind of like similar into that kind of stat area that like would also be cool with that tooling, which is something I worked on Netflix at Netflix for a little bit was um, a way to like look at data and then may maybe potentially flag it as uh, having PII or stuff like that. Because I think that like um, data that like so because that's another problem that uh, big companies often have is like having PII like go too far in the warehouse and just like proliferating all over the place and being able to like see where PII is showing up 
and like being able to like listen and maybe sample some of the rows of those new partitions to see like, oh, this matches like a social security number or this matches a credit card number, like, and being okay. able to like, then flag that as like, oh yeah, this is potentially PII. And because uh, that, that really can help um, minimize like uh, sensitive data leaks and all that stuff as well. It's, yeah, you can almost think of it like if something scanning your data warehouse or data lake, you know, as it comes together, building a bunch of statistics and like maybe it's a little agent that's like, hey, wait a minute, this looks like an email field and it shouldn't be in, yeah. the, in the silver cluster, right? Or, yeah. Whatever, and like raising Oh, yeah, it. exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good idea. The other thing we talked about, like I think we're going to see evolution around is, uh, you know, uh, like database proxies, like things that um, that get somewhere in between, you know, people querying the data, whether it's in, you know, analytics tools or, or notebooks or wherever, and the database to like reroute, transpile, um, apply data security, the like data, pol like data access policy things, uh, apply some like costs rules, right? Saying like, oh, you've, you can't run this query because it's too expensive and you know you don't have the clearance to run it or you ran out of budget you know that kind of stuff so it's like doing that and then maybe like oh you know you're asking for a query on the bookings data set but um you know i might have a series of data set in different databases to answer your question and depending on the nature of your query i'm going to route it a certain way or transpile mm -hmm. it a different way there's a huge opportunity in that in area i think to to put some of what used to be in the semantic layer uh, maybe like in in that database proxy world. Um, very cool. Uh, I'm curious uh, for both of you. What's like the most exciting trend when it comes like within data products? Uh, it's it's in general. It seems very new. Uh, I'm sure in five years we'll be talking about something else entirely. So I'm curious, like in in this space of building data products, like what's the most exciting thing that you guys have have seen? All right. Um, uh, so I think for me, uh, there's a couple of things there in the data product space. I think one of the things I find really exciting is just that like things should be getting easier, right? And that like we should be able to be be able to build these things end to end. But like it's almost like the the thing I find very exciting about this stuff is that like the the future of it should be easier. <laughs> the future and and it should be more accessible and easier to do for everyone. Like like. Yeah, just like what Max was saying, I was like, oh, you BigQuery, Snowflake, all these things that is like, you kind of like, like, uh, you know, duct tape them again, together. And then it's like, oh, now you have a stack, right? And then you can work with that stack to, you know, enforce quality and enforce everything else. And that like, I think that like the, that, that um, infrastructure and the proliferation of that infrastructure is like really, really exciting because it makes it so, yeah, the, the technical bar isn't so high, right? And I think that's really exciting. <laughs> Yeah, I'll take uh, on my side. It's like I think it's like the what's exciting is the maturation of the data engineering roles and practices and best practices. So it used to be like you're a data engineer and you, you write pipelines and you, there's there's not a lot of like you know rules to follow or best best practices written. And then I think like now we're taking the learnings from software engineering and the DevOps uh, you know mindset and applying that to data engineering. We see like just overall that. The tooling is maturing, the practice is maturing, the engineers themselves are maturing. And then the most exciting thing is we get to like give the data pipeline stuff. Like data pipeline is like the, the pain of our existence. And we give that to the analyst engineer and let them do that. So we can focus, <laughs> get a little bit closer to infrastructure maybe and, and work more with metadata, governance, uh, this sort of thing. So I, I don't know, I still, I, I like writing pipeline. The thing I really like is like when you write a pipeline you're kind of a scout discovering a new, new data and you get to be the first one to do the first data visualizations on it. So that's exciting. But then maintaining pipeline uh, and change management and data is so freaking hard and painful. It's really easy to create a new pipeline. It's really hard to maintain it forever. Um, so that's like the, hopefully we get the toolings that help us manage, like do stuff like change management and um and fix the the pipelines and we're not there yet like i think that part of like you want to change a field name in a table and then you're just not going to do it because you're going to break so many things and things that you don't necessarily you you know you know that you don't know everything you're going to break <laughs> you know by change. so then you're like i'll just create a new field with a new name that's a derived of the other one and i'll you know put something in a note and the column description like to be deprecated or something like that you know but yeah, change management, I'm hoping can get, uh, can get better. And maybe we'll share that with the analyst engineer now. 
Yeah, it seems like the second we make something easier as an industry, we've now made it easier. And so there's going to be more of it. It's harder to manage. It's going to be more complex, right? So it's always that uh, that revolving door or that, that kind of, yeah, that force that always has to be balanced. Um, or even like when you talk about self-serve analytics, you have the same thing. You want everyone to play with data and then you also need to like, you know, help people um, enforce different things and, and build some maturity there. So it seems like, yeah, I don't know. I feel like even in five years, we're going to be still talking about the same thing. Like things will be easier and harder um, in, or seriously, more complex. Seriously, like I, I have a guilt feeling from like having started Airflow. And I think like, I think on the DBT side is, is just the same thing. If you make it easier for people to do more things, like the, empowering the analyst engineer is a great thing, but it's also a very, like that leads to mountains of unmanageable SQL to, you know, to manage and, and you know, have, have forever. Uh, so that we have to be cautious with that, but making things easier, yeah, enables hordes of people to misdo this thing. You know? Yeah, yeah, uh, makes sense. Cool. Uh, we're getting close to the end. We'll do some Q and A. So, last kind of main topic area I wanted to talk to both of you about is uh, data apps. I think Max kind of suggested, talked a bit, hinted at it a little bit earlier in the conversation. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think we're really excited about data applications. Um, I'm curious, like Zach, what your take is on, on data apps, like the rise of data apps, like specifically, you know, you mentioned Streamlit, right? It's interesting to see like Snowflake buying Streamlit, like SNCC bought like top code data. You have database companies like Timescale that are building their own products on top of their own database, which is really like interesting. In the past, mm -hmm. like database people kind of just stuck to databases, right? And made that really good. So I'm curious, like, what what do you what do you guys think is responsible for for kind of driving this this trend, the rise of of data apps, and what kind of excites you about that? Yeah, I um I, I think a couple of things that are like what one of the things that I I found really exciting about data apps, like in general, is that like it's something that allows you to do the full loop with data, like where like especially with machine learning, right? Where if you have like a model that need, where you need labels for that model, and then you can uh, so you have your model, you have your labels for that model, and then you surface those to the user, uh, to the to the labeler, and be like, "Hey, labeler person, like, is this was was the model right or wrong?" And then and then you can take that data and bring it back in, and then make the model smarter and smarter, and do like a, a closed loop. And I think that's like where, at least for me, that was where I first like was applying data apps was in that kind of domain of like, okay, how do we create a closed loop um, for uh, our machine learning model? I think um, it's more, but like it definitely is broader than that. And I think that like uh, a big thing around data apps that's different from like the the past was that like people before was like the old data app was like kind of like a Tableau dashboard, I guess a little bit where it was like, oh yeah, here's, here's your viz and you can look at it and you can kind of slice and dice and do these things. And then I think people realized a couple of things. Like one, they were like, I want to like annotate and label and store things for the future, right? And and that you can't really do that with Tableau or like most dashboarding tools. Uh, so you want to be able to write data. I think that's a big part of it. And then another thing is is like they realize like, oh yeah, like if I want to like change the version of these like dashboards, that's also kind of painful, right? Because and and that's where like the data app stuff's nice because it's like a it's like a software engineering mindset to these dashboards and to these front ends that like you can use to like version and create things that like we're gonna stick around a lot longer. And so you, you kind of get both, you get that read, write, and you also get the version stuff. And I think those are the things that really are really exciting about like data intensive apps. Yeah, there's, there's so many, so many things there too. That's like, you know, when we talk about like, what are the different types of data apps? And one I would categorize as like the, the descendants of R shiny. So, so R, you know, R, R studio, the, the language and the IDE, and then R shiny was kind of a, a way to take a, uh, an R little application and, and productionize it and put, slap a GUI on top and become like a little micro tool. And I think like Streamlit is a little bit like that too. Of like, if you have a notebook, you can parameterize it and make a micro app with it. I think it's more than that. Like, I don't want to be reductive, but, but it's yeah. like generally you have a notebook or you have a process. It's a little bit like a script oriented approach. And then yeah, parameterize it, put some little controls on top and, and you know, show, show some data viz, which is cool. Then there's like, data apps as, um, you know, kind of the analytics everywhere. I mean, that's the title of the podcast too. So like there's the part of this idea of analytics everywhere is transcending the BI tool. So the BI tool has been the special, special specialized place where you go as a 
maybe data professional to consume data and explore data. And I think like data is most useful in context. So like if you, you're able to bring the analytics to your daily workflows and you know, the applications you use every day, and you're able to do things like write back and take actions, like issue a refund or label something or add an annotation that other people using the same app are going to see. Um, there's a there's a lot of value in bringing the analytics to where the work is taking place, as opposed to bringing people where the BI tool lives. Um, so there's these different categories. There's a really good, um, I would recommend Ben Stencil's post too on the, the acquisition, like his read on the acquisition of uh, Streamlit, which is interesting. And I think like Streamlit's goal, I, I think he, he um, not sure if he paraphrases or quotes them, but it says like part of uh, uh, Streamlit's uh, may, maybe vocation is to like allow data scientists or analysts to create micro like small apps in minutes. There's a question too of like, how do we enable software engineers to build, you know, big apps in days or uh, or in weeks, right? What's the right tool set if you want to bring interactive analytics inside an application that you're building today? And I'm really just bringing the, some of the ideas from like Ben's post. Um, another idea we're talking about is if we say data app, app might have a meaning around uh, like an app store, right? So if you're like, oh, it's a data app, then there should be an app store. So he's talking more about like, oh, could people um like could, could like zach and i build some little uh data apps that people can use um against their data warehouse of their data source maybe provided you know universal you know type schemas or uh you know if you have if your customer data is oriented in a certain way we could have a little data app that does certain things around customer data and like sell that as a service so that i'm less convinced that that part of the app store for like data for data applications i, I see it less but analytics everywhere I see, like people, like let's bring the analytics and all the apps and products and workflows we use every day. Nice, awesome, um, exciting. So we're at the top of the hour. So let's uh, let's go through some of the the questions. We have we have a ton of Q and A. So I'm excited to to see what you guys think for each of these. So. Uh, Larry Chapman asks, 90% um, of the world's data was created in the last 18 months. I think that's uh, repeating Zach's quote there. Uh, an enterprise organization running multiple stacks, how do we avoid running, too, running into too much technical debt and, and how do we maintain a good developer ecosystem? It's a massive data set. How do we incentivize change and scale and maintain reliability and velocity? It's kind of like basically, I think to summarize, like how, how do you do change management around uh, in, in large enterprise organizations when you have um, all this all this tech debt and and changing changing code base that, one, that one's for zach i'm not a part of a large yeah. <laughs> you're like it's, it's been too many years i forgot right <laughs> not my problem you know? um i think uh, a couple things there uh i think a big part about ma uh, change management is like one is you need like i think one of the biggest part is just you need really good communication and if you have things that have a lot of downstreams like you also need to have good expectations that it's going to take a while. Like, like, uh, you know, a good migration can take three to six months of, to get everyone on board. And, uh, that's another big thing is, is like being able to set up good guides on like, okay, here are the columns. Here's the, here are things, how things are going to change. And here, well, here's why it's a slight difference or a slight variation of this rule and, um, things like that, I think is one, I think another side of it though, is like, uh, in reducing tech debt, is also just making sure that your engineers are like writing good code to begin with, right? So that you get you you prevent tech debt as opposed to like fixing it later. And a big part of that, I think, is a, is around like inspiring a good code review culture, right? So that like when someone uh, asks you for a review, you don't just say "looks good to me," stamp it, and you know like, you send them on their way, right? You actually like look at the code, and then you'll see things like, "Oh, hey, like you're scanning too many partitions here," like you're scanning 300 partitions when like you could scan one and do like a cumulative pattern or like really kind of giving people a lot of like feedback on their pipelines. And because if you can instill those best practices throughout the org, then that will just make your tech debt life over the, over the long run a lot easier because then you're preventing more creation of tech debt and the best practices. So that's how, that's probably what I would say to like really, um, 
work on those kind of things, like for big enterprises. There's there's a lot there though. That's a very uh, that, that question you can I could talk about that for an hour, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we can take others like sub questions to hear people want to mm -hmm. drill deeper into certain. I mean, I wanted to talk about tech debt too. Like to me, I see debt as you know, people might say like uh, debt is awful and no one should have any, but like the reality is like debt is really an enabler and it's a tool. Uh, and maybe you have to like just be very conscious of like when you take debt and when and how much the interest on that debt is and inform what you're going to pay off based on what is really expensive in terms of. Uh, interest so like use it as a tool too because like not everything can be perfect and rigorous from the get-go um it's easier to front the debt right the, you know if, if we do an analogy with like the american people and credit cards and mortgages um i wouldn't be sitting in this house today if that was not a tool right so i think like it's enabling me to do great things to have access to debt at the same time i don't want to put everything on my credit card and not pay it off so i think you just have to be deliberate uh, maybe, maybe there's like some meetings where, uh, and I don't know on what frequency, depends where you're at on the life cycle, but where you do an inventory of the debt and the same way you would take all your credit card bills, you know, and uh, your mortgages and your interest rate and you look at everything that there is there and you decide, okay, this month we're going to pay off this thing or this year we should really stop yeah. taking this kind of debt or using this credit card, right? So, uh, mm -hmm. so I think being deliberate and then just like self-conscious around that stuff is important. Yeah, I love yeah, that too because... I was just gonna say, I mean, I think debt as a, the finance metaphor is great. Cause like, yeah, you take out a loan for college or, or to start a business and you get some short-term growth, like it's a great thing. Um, but obviously at some point, you know, you have interest, you pay interest for that, right? You pay interest on that every month. You're like 10% slower. Um, you have to pay it down over time. And uh, I think that's a great metaphor. Go ahead, Zach. Like, did you have an answer to Yeah, And like, uh, one of the things that uh, we do at Airbnb as well is we are deliberate about it. Like, so every, no. Sorry, I think we have a lag, but- uh, ah, yeah. delay, go ahead. Like, okay, cool. Um, yeah, so one thing I do at Airbnb is like, we have uh, a week, a week, one week, a quarter where we do like quality days. Ah, no, laggy. <laughs> <laughs> It's coming back. Oh, maybe. Oh, well, man, my internet's weird right now. All right. I, I think we're, we're good now. All right. Yeah. So at, uh, at Airbnb, we have like a quality day, right? Uh, like we're a week, like at the end of the quarter where like we, we look at all the tech debt, the backlog and like actually, you know, try to make progress on it. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think like I love these like bashes too. It's a way to raise attention on certain topics too. So if you have a, a quality bash, then that means like more people in the organization can get together and like really think about quality for a day. And then this has like, this pays dividends too after where it changes the, the mindset. Another thing around debt too is this idea of like bankruptcy. Maybe it's okay. Like if really in some areas, uh, the debt is too expensive, the interest is too expensive. Like it's okay to just like, you know, shut that thing down and declare bankruptcy and rebuild, you know, and I'm not saying you should do that with your data warehouse, but maybe it's like a set of schemas, or maybe it's a, uh, a subset of your warehouse, a subset of your pipeline, uh, everything that was written by Max in 2014, for instance, you should definitely like bankrupt that, you know? <laughs> yes. Um, it has a follow-up question on product management. So how, how do you how do you guys feel that data engineering and product management should be interfaces? Like what what is the expectation from from the data team, from data engineering, uh, from the product team? How can product help help the data team um, improve uh, or help you make better decisions? Basically, maybe I'll I'll lead with this one. Uh, but like one thing is like for product to instrument. Yep stuff that they build is a really important thing, right? So um, so to make sure that when people build a new feature uh, and PMs build new things, they don't just think about the product, uh, the, the design and product experience. They also think about like, how is the data gonna be logged and how is it gonna flow in the warehouse and are we gonna, gonna be able to like track the launch and beyond. So that's one thing in terms of like, can I think there are uh, data PMs who help design data sets and do it like I haven't worked with them personally, but I see value in that. And my dogs are barking now.
So, Sridi, it looks like we have a lag now, or I don't know. I Are know. you on the same uh, time scale? I'm, I'm okay, but I think Zach, Zach might be lagging. If you want to go... Uh, All right, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm back now. I think, I'm, I think we're good. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. So awesome. I think for um, product stuff, uh, like how product managers and everything can help data engineers, like one of the, one of the problems that I've noticed is that like, sometimes like they will uh, like, like ask for things kind of too ad hoc, right? Cause recognizing that there's like a trade-off between like getting an answer fast and getting an answer like in a scalable way. Right. And in a way that is like maintainable and scalable and like and so like, that's a big thing. Cause like a lot of data engineers, like they have this thing, it's called the, the death of ad hoc requests, right? Where it's just like so many requests that they get that they, and they feel they need to serve those. But then the only way that they can do that is by like cutting corners. And I think that like PMs, like planning ahead of time, like making sure that like these things get on quarterly roadmaps when they can, sometimes they can't, sometimes it's literally like a, a, a business decision halfway through the quarter where we need to pivot and that, that can happen. But those things should probably be minimized and most, most data needs can be anticipated. And I think that like PMs who are, who can adopt that mindset and work with their data engineers in that way will like be more successful and they'll, they'll, they'll have better data and be able to answer questions faster. Yes. Yeah, so that, so that thing that used to be so real and I'm hoping like the analyst engineer role might help with that, but we used to get like all sorts of like, hey, we're launching something this week, or we need to, we need an answer on something something that has come to mind recently, and then the analysts would kind of scramble to find an answer because they couldn't do that using the the derived tables, right, and the the you know the stuff that had been built by data engineer. They'd go to raw tables and answer the question, and then the the data engineer was like, okay, how are we gonna bring this new this new thing that, you know, so that we can answer this question reliably in the future. And then that would, that would take months. And by the time, by the time that these answers come and it makes it to like a proper say dashboard or the, the warehouse properly, it's kind of too late. That, that topic is not a hot topic anymore, right? No one cares anymore about like mm -hmm. teen engagement on Facebook. Like after we kind of figured it out, um, you know, like three months later when we have all this, those pipeline written, it's not as interesting and important anymore. So. I don't know. It's like there is like maybe if uh, the there is a the, uh, the analyst engineer might be able to mitigate like is that short term request long term request do I bring that in my pipelines or do I just like give someone a quick answer? Um, it's it's mm -hmm. that's always been tricky to deal with. Yeah, um, uh, I think that's a great. Those are all great points. Um, Nadine has a good question on. So data administration focused on data pipelines to serve uh, internal data scientists and analysts. Um, when it comes to application developers, data apps, what tools and techniques can data engineers learn or should they learn to support application developers that are building data products directly? So basically, how should data engineering interface more with uh, this kind of rise of people who are building data apps? External facing or internal facing is a, is probably an, you know, I think if you're yeah. building data apps for internal uh, uses, which we did a lot of like at Airbnb and Facebook, like a lot of the innovation on data apps was internal facing. Um, I think that's a very different answer for like the requirements for internal facing stuff is very, very different from the, the requirements from external facing stuff. I can take the answer on the external stuff uh, after Zach, do you have like thoughts on that? Yeah. Oh yeah, I think there's a couple things. Like one of the things that I think is important uh, at Airbnb, and it's one of the things that I work on quite a bit, is how do you build a pipeline that mimics the online services, right? So say like uh, we want to know what the pricing and availability for a listing is, right? Well, one way you could do it, right, is you could ping Airbnb.com, make a rest <laughs> call, and you know you can get the pricing and availability back. But like that that puts load on the server that does a lot of other things that like that could make the server crash or all sorts of things because if you if you need to do it for every listing that's a lot of requests so one of the things that i think data engineers can do with when you have pipeline requirements like that is how do you make those pipelines offline right where you can just where you can pump them through a library and you don't even talk to the server at all right and you and you and you can you can replicate the same logic offline as you have online but you don't pump it through the same way. You don't pump it through rest. You don't pump it through those things. Cause that's like inefficient and like not scalable. And it also can interfere. It can have, it has like unintended, unintended consequences around like, Oh, like server load and non-responsiveness. And I think that like, 
uh, working with application developers to, because you also have to work with the app developers on this, because if they have their code written in the wrong way and it's too coupled, where like the rest layer is coupled with the, lo the, the business logic, then um, you, you can't write a pipeline like that, right? And so I think that working with them to have those layers split so that you can have a pipeline that kind of just like uses the logic underneath and it doesn't go all the way to the server, that that can be a huge win for um, for data products as well. Yes, yeah, so some thoughts for me, you know, I'm thinking now, let's say you're building, let's say you work at a SaaS company and then you want to bring in, you know, an analytics section inside uh, in, inside your application. So let's say you're an applicant tracking system like Lever, right? Like to, to help people with recruiting and flow and you want to have a section that shows you know, your different funnels and the number of interview rates and month, month over month growth of interview, like that kind of, you want to do like interactive visualization. So question, okay, what do you, how do you build that data app? And it's kind of sad that we don't really have like really good refer reference implementation to go and build these like data products today. So, you know, for instance, you, you need an analytics database that's can take like good uh, you know, rates of query per second that can give like sub second answer, you know, that you probably want to have like a higher level of rigor than you have for your internal analytics. Um, can you use BigQuery to power that app? Can you use Snowflake? I don't know. Do people use Snowflake to power like live um, application? That sounds like kind of reasonable, but kind of unreasonable. I, I don't know why it feels like not fully reasonable to me. So maybe you need to. Yeah. Yeah, that stuff is like really tricky. And then does it make sense to add this pot, this DAG? So let's say you need a DAG, you need some some pipelines. Does it make sense to throw this pipeline and then pull a pipeline with the data warehouse? Like it doesn't sound like it makes sense to me. Like you would have to like create maybe a different Airflow DAG or a different, you know, DBT project that was very isolated for the purpose of that app. Maybe a different account, a different Snowflake account that's well isolated. And then the level of yeah. rigor there needs to be like much higher than the one you have for internal analytics. And that like, there's no reference implementation. And as far as I know, no one has really written on that. There's like, uh, is it Matt? Uh, I forgot his last name, but the guy who wrote the book, like building data intensive applications. Martin Klepman. Matt, my, Mart yeah, Martin Klepman. Really, it's a good book, but it's dated at this, or I think it's already like five years old. So I think like data apps. He's writing like, the second edition, thankfully. Nice. Well, yeah. uh, you know, shout out for for uh, Martin on that. But uh, maybe we should bring him on the show and talk about uh, building data intensive yeah. application too. For sure. More uh, thoughts, Zach? Yeah. Um, I think uh, so, so, just some some other thoughts I have there are like um, like yeah, generally like I think what you were saying about like using Snowflake or BigQuery feels weird because it feels like you're like. Am I just gonna let the customer query my data lake? Like, am I just gonna let them just go right to the lake, right? Like, that seems like it's like, uh, probably not, right? And I think like at least um, like most of the companies I worked at, it's like the they use they always use like some sort of read optimized store, like usually like Druid or like at Facebook they had a thing called Raptor. Raptor was what they used for like a lot of those things where it's like, oh yeah, we want low latency queries that are kind of like separated from the rest of our compute storage so that like we know that those queries are going to be fast and that like they, and th that they won't have a ton of load because of like competing like other priorities that were just different. And um and so yeah, definitely 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 agree that like it feels weird to be like, yeah, just yeah, customer just query Snowflake, right? Or like yeah, we'll just put query API in between, but it feels weird for sure. Yeah, it's like the Snowflake have the right property. And you definitely wanna like one thing you want is isolation. So I think the the pipelines and the data warehouse, like you want a different account, different project, like kind of really isolate that stuff, which brings like, oh, but what if you're sharing code? So then you probably need to have like shared library between like the publicly available stuff and the and the private stuff like if you're like oh we use the same logic or the same models the same kind of uh, pipeline logic on both sides now you do want to duplicate code or do you want to have a shared library who's like you know um where the rigor is is higher too you want to have observability too or right? you want to know if the pipelines are late or are going to be late uh or if there's too much latency like if you have like too much query per second and you know lag time is cranking like you need to treat it like a real 
application. So I think there's there's a lot of work to be done there too. There's also, you know, I appreciate we offer um, embedded BI too. So that's like, you know, that's one way to do it is to embed a BI dashboard. And that's kind of an easy way to get some analytics in your application, but it doesn't fulfill the full promise of the data app, right? Like where you want to, so you can bring interactive analytics in your app but it doesn't necessarily answer all the questions. And then for the purpose of embedded, we also recommend to for people to ask, isolate their pipeline, isolate their data warehouse. Like you want to be able to track cost for your, you know, your data app isolate in an isolated way, then you track your cost for your data warehouse for the rest of the stuff. So mm -hmm. yeah. And you can imagine like a, a customer data app or dashboard being down because someone ran a, a bad query internally. Yeah. <laughs> Probably don't want that, right? Um so yeah. that makes that makes sense. A lot of I think isolation seems to be uh, the name of the game. Um, interesting question. Uh, Larry actually has a, a question on mental health. I know Zach, this is a big topic for you. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm curious. You know, we're all tech workers. Spend eight hours a day staring into a screen and and using and we likely to use other screens to disconnect. Um, how do you how do you guys disconnect and try to maintain a, a healthy lifestyle? That's that's great. Um, one of the things for me that I think is super, super important is just actually disconnecting. Like, I mean, most of the time on like either Saturday or Sunday, like I will try to not look at my phone at all or very minimally, like maybe an hour or two, like tops. And, uh, and then I spend a lot of that time, like in nature, like walking around, going on hikes, like really trying to connect with the earth. Right. And be like, yes, I am a human. I am on this planet. Like, I'm not just like a sequel monkey, like pushing data around. Like I'm actually, I'm an actual freaking human. Right. And, uh, I think that's a, that's a big thing I do to like kind of disconnect and like, uh, kind of get back to like, like, um, being able to feel like I'm not like just looking at a screen all the time. And that's a big one. I also just like e exercise is a big thing for me. Like, and just being able to, uh, take that time to like, I, I like to run. Running is my favorite thing. It's very meditative, right? Cause you just like focusing on moving your body around. And I think that like those two things really help me a lot. Those things help me like a, a lot in maintaining like my sanity for sure. <laughs> yeah. For, for me, I'm not sure if I'm able to maintain my sanity. I, I do my best, you know, uh, but no, uh, for me, I mean, I moved in Tahoe in December. I, I mentioned that. So I think that's a big shift uh of lifestyle like i love mm -hmm. nature sport like hiking uh, i mountain bike i snowboard a lot so i think like being here is going to make it that much more you know easy for for me to do these things um i think like different people need very different things right in terms of like to stay sane like some people might be able to cope with like working 70 hours a week and not doing it i, I don't know if people can do it but yeah i think people have different needs i think to think to spend time for introspection too of like how do i spend my time how do i want to spend my time um a little bit like you know your own self therapy of like am i doing the things that energize me every day or am i doing too many things that you know drain my energy uh so i think putting the time like beginning of week end of week self reflection to be like just like not necessarily meditate in a formal sense or maybe meditate in a formal sense if you, you want to do that but to think about like Hey, is that, you know, am I fulfilled here? Am I spending time the right way? Uh, how do I do more of the things that energize me versus the thing that drain my energy, uh, this sort of stuff to be deliberate about that and not being a victim of your calendar or a victim of what people want from you is really important, but it's, it's very difficult too. Mm -hmm. as a, as a yeah. founder, it's rough. For sure. Um, we'll do two more questions and then we can call it a wrap. So Nadine uh, has another great question. Uh, which is a good segue to the last question, actually, or from two questions ago, rather, uh, which is there's, you know, a, now a shift and emphasis on uh, towards real time analytics. And as I think Nadine read y'all's mind that maybe Snowflake may not really be up to the task for this. Um, companies like Imply and, and Rockset are suited to handle heavy compute. How do you see companies handling real time analytics? Do you think there will be an emerging kind of real time analytics stack? Uh, that's maybe, you know, runs parallel to the traditional uh, modern data stack. That's great. I think uh, there's a couple of things there. Like, um, so when I worked at Netflix, I actually worked in cybersecurity. So like we did a lot of stuff with real time because, you know, if you catch the bad guy in batch, yeah. it's a little bit too late. Um, and so um, like, I think there's a couple of things there. Like, I think 
a, for a while there was like this this pipe dream around spark because they were like oh spark and spark streaming like together like you can just you know like one pipeline that does both right and it's a magical and awesome and like that's uh i think that was a little bit naive for the most part that like and and most people are like that i've been talking to lately they don't really even use spark streaming anymore they're like that wasn't the right way to do it like it's better to go with like a tool called like Flink. Apache Flink seems to be like the, the open source, like golden child in the streaming ca category. Uh, I think that you're uh, that like the whole idea around like companies building products around it. I really think that like, you know, Databri Databricks and Snowflake are going to, they're going to deliver something awesome here. I would imagine that like over the next couple of years, we're going to see something that's going to be really awesome from these companies that will make uh, real time like a lot easier because yeah even even at the big tech companies whenever i wanted to like set up a real-time job like facebook had it best though like where they had like puma puma was great puma like worked pretty well and uh that was like a that was like probably my best real-time experience in terms of like iteration speed and then at netflix and airbnb it's like oh you want to you want to do a real-time job all right like go spin up your own spinnaker app go freaking deploy your own flink job go write a bunch of scala and it's like, it's like, I'm doing a like, this is like, I have to do, it feels like you're writing everything yourself, right? You like, there's not one, one piece of the infrastructure that like you're reusing. And so I think that, yeah, def, it's definitely an area that's ripe for innovation, but like, it would be awesome to see if like, we can get some more progress on, you know? <laughs> yeah. Th th tons of thought on my side on, on real time. One thing was like, um, you know, the Apache beam promise or this idea that you could write a pipeline that is both, um, you know, serving real time and not real time. Um, mm -hmm. So you write the pipeline once and you're able to say like, oh, maybe we just launch a product. It's more expensive to run it in real time, but we'll run it, you know, with low latency. And then later on as the, the launch, you know, goes forward like for cost reason or operability reasons, you're like, okay, we're, we'll run it daily now. Um, I think it's an attractive idea that is not getting delivered on. Like I, the reality is like people still write, you know, different, you have to, you, you cannot write in one, language and then assume it's going to work on both sides too um i remember at lyft too talking with with people that that were i call them the streamers that are more like the people who are like oh everything's going to be like a streaming pipeline in the end and everything will be in flink and we'll kill all the bad jobs um and i was like take just one pipeline take i'll, I'll give you like one hive ql query like just one you know that's it's not even that complicated and then you go and write a flink pipeline for this thing and then what if, if you manage to do it i'll give you 50 more and if you manage to do it i'll give you a thousand yeah. you know they're like they would get pretty overwhelmed with just that first one and say like holy shit yeah this is not this is not easy um another thing that i know that i think is kind of a greater truth is when you start really looking at the real-time use cases that require you know sub five minutes sub 15 minute uh freshness um like when you really dig to like which metrics and dimensions you need to power this use case, it's typically there's really not that much left there, right? So um, so let's say, and I'm not sure if that, that's always absolutely true. I think on the size of like observability stuff like incident management and like stuff you use like things like Datadog or for, right? Like you need to have real time and a lot of dimensionality, but for like your product analytics and i know we're, we're not limited to that here we're talking about analytics in general but for product analytics if you need to make a decision on what happened in the past 15 seconds or minute um you probably should be a bot right it should be you shouldn't be someone refreshing a dashboard uh or if you have an incident then maybe like maybe waiting 15 minutes or an hour for the batch to come in is not that crazy and then what do you need really at that level of freshness Right. So maybe you, you want to look at, so say at Airbnb, you might look at something like our bookings affected, like this thing is just happening. We have a bad deploy. How much are bookings affected? Mm -hmm. uh, but you, do you need to be able to go into like super deep? I think you'd rely more on your observability, operational analytics for this stuff. Yeah. So I don't know. I would say question that as practitioners, like one thing is like when people are like, oh, I want everything real time. They're like, wait, wait, wait. Like, what's your use case? What do you really need real time for? Uh, and maybe if you're at Lyft, it might be like, hey, we need a way for the, the agent who is receiving a call from a person to be able to um, issue a ref to look at like what just happened and then issue a refund. And then looking at that, you're like, oh, can we do that? Can we do that on the product front as opposed to on the analytics side of things? Right. And uh, thinking really about like, what is the information you need? Is it available? What do you need to what do you really, 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 really need in real time? Because it's hard, you know. 
Yeah, and and not and 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 really think about that because micro batch is so amazing. Like just doing things on an hourly basis. Hourly pipelines like are really powerful. That was like I was one of the like one of the things that happened for me at Facebook was like I was writing this pipeline to like dedupe notifications. And uh, they were like, yeah, do it in real time so we can have it available as soon as possible. And then like, I like tried and I was like, this is not going to work. <laughs> this is not going to work at all. And like, we don't even need it in real time, actually. And then like, I moved it to like an hourly dedupe thing. And it was like, so good. It was like, it felt like, oh, yeah, this is exactly what we actually needed. And really, that's a thing. I think that's a thing that data, good data engineers need to do is when they get a requirement from a stakeholder, they like actually dig into it a little bit and like give them what they need, not what they ask for. Like, I think that's another thing that like can be really helpful yeah. for sure. This is that product thinking job to be done mm -hmm. theme all over again. Um, you know, maybe it's funny you said real time, maybe even they meant real time, they needed it yesterday. Like they needed it delivered <laughs> real time. Not, yes. Not, <laughs> uh, <laughs> not the actual thing. Okay, last question. I think this is a fun one. In your opinion, what's the sexiest part of data engineering? All right, I think that's it for the show today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, is there uh, what is the most fun part? Maybe or I, 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 I sexy, sexy kind of assume that it's uh, pretty to look at and kind of exciting from an external standpoint, like to look at the data engineering doing something and then be like, oh, that is cool and fun. But maybe we could talk about what's fun too, like what you enjoy doing, spending your time doing. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I think for me, a big thing is is like just building things that like are robust, right? Where it's like when a data scientist asks like, oh, can I solve this specific question? And then like, I actually deliver on a data model that can answer that question and like, like, like whatever other questions that they might have in the future, right? And like be trying to think about like, okay, what are the, the questions they're at, they want now and in the future and kind of like building those models and then because people really appreciate that like when they're like oh can because then instead of them asking like oh can you pull data for this you're like no here's the query you, you don't i don't need to pull data because it's already there you just need to query it right and uh and i think that that's one of my favorite things is like that forward looking like being able to build a model that fits like and fits like a, a pain right an analytical pain that then kind of makes that go away and because then your data scientists love you and they, they, they probably think you're sexy so i mean <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah for me i would say that the most exciting thing is doing the scouting on the data so like when you write a pipeline you're the very first person to see what comes out after you built it and um and to do the first phase of visualization so say like recently i added i think we had like a is activated flag, you know, on preset. So we're able to see like what the, which users and teams are activated and not activated. Um, so I added something called activation score. So I'm able to see like how um, waves of users distribute um, based on how they're activated and what they've done, what, what they haven't done. And just, just do like, oh my God, I'm the first person to kind of open this treasure box and like get to pick the, the gold nuggets and go and show them to people. So to go and find the inside, distribute it internally, uh, and then go to people and ask the next questions. Like here's questions and answers and what should we ask next? And what kind of, what do we need to, how do we need to change the pipeline to, to get more insight, you know, and looking at these distributions and data visualization. That's, that's why I went to like my, my passion for superset is, is really about like visualizing data in a way that, you know, tells stories. So that's my, my favorite thing. Is it sexy? I don't, I don't know. Oh, you're gonna have to ask others on that. Yeah. <laughs> Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Um, great, awesome. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, thanks, Zach, for for your time and and Max as well. This was this was a fun conversation. I think next time we should schedule like six or seven hours. I think probably. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, I, I want to hear Zach's. About. You know. Enterprise change management talk, it seems like uh, something. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure if I want to talk about change management anymore. <laughs> Just... uh, I'll leave that for someone else, maybe. For sure. But it was great. Awesome. Thank you so much, you two. Thanks, Zach, for being on the yep. show. It's super fun. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. Thanks, everyone.